Hello, I'm Ben Emner Rudenberg and today I'm going to explain you how to get from low order to high order coupling schemes in precise. This topic is a big part of my PhD project and today I would like to show you how to use this new feature that I'm currently developing. You probably already know this picture from our documentation or the website. It shows the main features of precise. Today I want to mainly discuss this block here, which deals with time interpolation. Let me show one picture from our paper on quasi Newton waveform iteration to explain what we actually plan to do. The basic idea here is that within one time window, this means between two calls to advance, we want to do several time steps, like in subcycling. And at the same time, we also want to interpolate between pieces of data in order to get a smooth approximation to the coupling boundary conditions. In this picture, we have on the left hand side a Dirichlet participant and on the right hand side a Neumann participant. You can also replace this with a fluid and a solid solver. The Dirichlet participant performs two time steps within one time window and for each time step, data is generated. From these pieces of data, we can now create a quadratic interpolation. And with this quadratic interpolation, we can provide data for the other participant, which it might sample at any place where it likes to sample this. That this is a, yeah, a good idea for more robust coupling. This is something we discussed in our paper and therefore I don't want to go too deep into the theory here. Today my goal is to go into a more practical direction and show you the implementation of our API that we currently have in precise for this purpose. I will show you different coupling schemes. I will start with the normal parallel implicit coupling that you probably already know. After that, I will show you how you can implement here the new experimental waveform API, which gives you access to time interpolation. First without subcycling and later with subcycling. As a prerequisite for this, I would recommend that you either know the fundamentals of precise video, especially section five about the application programming interface or section 2.5 of our precise reference paper version two. On top of this, in my examples, I will use yeah, initialized data to initialize data in, in the coupling. And what's also important is you will see some mapping calls, but they are not really important for what I'm explaining here. If you don't have the prerequisites, don't worry, you can probably still follow the, the rough idea about this talk. Um, but for fully understanding it, I think it's good if you know how the application programming interface is working and some parts might be a bit rough and a bit fast for you. My examples are heavily based on Jupyter Notebooks. So you can download and find these notebooks on my GitHub page. Generally, I think these Jupyter Notebooks are nice for interactively stepping through Precise, but I would not recommend them for development because error messages from Precise are not forwarded to Jupyter and therefore, yeah, you might get into situations where you don't know what's going on and you cannot really get this information. My first example will deal with the normal parallel implicit coupling. Here we have two solvers, a fluid and a solid solver, like in fluid structure interaction. Our first call to precise initialize will synchronize these two solvers and if necessary exchange the mesh. After that, we have the possibility to initialize data. This means that the fluid solver provides some initial forces for the solid solver and the solid solver provides some initial displacement for the fluid solver. And then we can directly start with the first time step. And here we can already use this initial data for performing our time step. And when the time step is over, we call it once in order to establish the coupling via precise again. Usually, if you do implicit coupling, you will do several iterations here and you will probably also do several time windows in order to reach the end of your simulation. So we will call it once again and maybe a few more times and then in the end we will finalize. 
This is the config file of our yeah, example for the parallel implicit coupling scheme. So here you see the um, two solvers, fluid and solid. They exchange forces and displacements. And like you see here, we have a parallel implicit coupling scheme. Um, what's important to note is that, yeah, for the sake of implicity, we just do two iterations in our implicit coupling. So this does not give us any meaningful output, but this is just to, to see what's going on and to be able to step through the iterations quickly. And what's also important is that we are initializing here. So this will actually require our call to initialize data. And here you can see two Jupyter notebooks that I yeah, created for this example. So at the top, we define a dummy fluid solver and a dummy solid solver. And this is doing something like, a, yeah, like an explicit Euler step. You get something like an initial condition X, and then you have a right hand side Y and a time step size. So this is of course not a, not a reasonable fluid solver, but for our example here, totally sufficient. And in this, in this Jupyter notebook, I can now just step through each cell one after the other. And yeah, I will now start doing the simulation in this kind of fashion. So first we define the fluid solver, then we import precise, and this takes a while because we have to load the library here. And now we initialize. And here we now have this synchronization point between the two solvers. So this solver here is now waiting for me to also continue on the right hand side with the solid solver. So this means I will do the same steps. And now, as soon as I press on run here, you will see on the left hand side that, yeah, it's not blocking anymore and this, the fluid solver doesn't have to wait anymore. Great, so now the two solvers are connected. And now the next step is that we initialize some data. And for this reason, I decided here to use some initial forces. I write the data over to the solid solver and the same happens on the side of the solid solver as well. So let's get through these steps. And when I initialize data, again, the fluid solver has to wait on the solid solver to perform exactly the same actions. Okay, and now we are ready to enter our first time window and actually do the, the coupling. For this, we now again go to the fluid solver. We read some data. Here you see that the data that we read is equal to, to two, which is exactly the initial displacement that we defined here. Then we do one step with our dummy fluid solver. We get some result and we call it once in order to send the data to the other solver. And here again, we have to wait because yeah, the both solvers have to synchronize. Now we also do this first window with our solid solver. And this is exactly the same as for the fluid solver. And now when I hit run, then the both solvers will again synchronize, exchange data, and the fluid solver doesn't have to wait anymore. Good. So now we quickly check if the time window is complete. And that's not the case because we have to do two iterations like we defined in the config file. So we now just do our second iteration for this first window. Again, we are waiting. So I will continue with these steps on the side of the fluid solver as well. And now the first window is complete. And you also see this by calling is time window complete. And the same procedure is, um, is, is carried out for each of the following time windows. So now I just put this in a, in a loop, which is probably more familiar to you. And as we see here, again, we are waiting for the other one. So I also started over here and yeah, we get a lot of output, but in the end, this only means that we are exchanging some data from solid to fluid and from fluid to solid. And in the end, we finalize precise and our simulation is complete. This brings us to the end of our first example. And what I've shown you now is yeah, just a normal workflow for parallel implicit coupling with yeah, data initialization. And yeah, why, why do we have to improve this? Um, this is again something that we've shown in our paper. 
Um, the normal implicit coupling only gives you first order. So this means if you want to use something like a higher order time stepping scheme, like for example in our paper, the trapezoidal rule, you yeah, actually cannot do this just with the normal API that Precise provides you. Um, additionally, in our paper, we have used subcycling, meaning that you use smaller time steps than the time window size. And here, there's another problem, um, because when you exchange data only at the end of the time window, you have to use always the same boundary conditions in every single time step. And this gives you, like you see here in this convergence plot, just yeah, not really a, a good convergence. So here in this line, you see first order. So this is what you would expect for the time stepping scheme that we are using. And actually our convergence is, is worse than, than expected. So this basically shows us, okay, we need a, a more advanced coupling scheme here. And this is what I will introduce now. So our idea is to use waveforms. So if you remember from before, we exchange interval lengths between the participants. For this purpose, we extend the configuration file. So this means you now have the possibility to provide a waveform order here to tell precise which order the interval length should have. Another important thing is you have to set experimental equals true here to tell precise that this experimental API is used. Um, we're using this special experimental flag to yeah, declare this feature as experimental and this means that it's not considered stable yet because we still might want to change things here. Um, the other thing which is important about our new API is of course how you call it from your application code. And here the big change is that you don't call read scalar data just with the read data ID and the vertex ID, but additionally you provide a relative read time. And this means that you can now sample your interpolant at any place in time you like, which is within the current time window. And we say relative read time because if you set this to zero, it's the beginning of the current time step. And if you set it to the end of the window, it's the end of the window. To illustrate how this API is used, we now have a second example. And Compared to the example from before, there are only a few small differences. First of all, we now mark our force, which we use for initialization as F0, because this is the force that we associate with the beginning of our simulation at the starting time. Um, additionally, you see here that these yeah, boundary conditions that go into our solved time step, so D, the displacement, and F the force are printed here. And of course we needed these boundary conditions also previously, but now I want to make this very explicit that our boundary condition in the very, very first iteration in the first time window will be constant because we just use the yeah, initial condition that is available. And what becomes more interesting is now if we call it once and we send forces and displacements for the end of our time step, so this is indicated by the subscript here, F1, which means at the end of the first time window, and the zero here refers to our zeroth iteration in this first time window. And now we exchange these forces and displacements, and this gives us the possibility to perform linear interpolation in the second iteration of our first time window. So now our force will actually be not constant anymore, but instead of that, we have here a linear interpolant. And this is something that Precise allows us now to directly access. And this, like we showed in our paper, will also allow us to get a higher um, accuracy for our coupling. In the end, of course, you do several iterations. So here we have a superscript K, and you will also do several time windows. But in our example, we just go through the first time window. And after that, I think every sh everything should become clear. Like for the previous example, I will start by showing you the configuration file that we're going to use. As explained before, we need experimental being set to true in order to be able to access the experimental API. Additionally, we have here our waveform order of zero for the read data of the fluid participant. So the displacement is just interpolated as a constant. 
and we have waveform order equals one for the forces that are read by the solid participant. So here we perform linear interpolation. The rest is exactly the same like in the previous example. So there are, for example, no changes for our coupling scheme. I will now use the same notebooks that I have used for the previous example. For this, I will first clear all the output and then I will pick the configuration file that I've shown you a moment before. So we comment out this line and use our experimental configuration file. Now we do exactly the same as before. So we initialize precise, initialize data and continue until we reach the first window. Now we are in our first window and here it becomes interesting now because if we read data our new waveform API will be used and here we already see the first change. Precise gives us a warning because it's wondering why we are defining waveform order equals to one and then we don't actually use the new API calls because then setting the order to one doesn't make any sense because we will always get the same value anyway. So to silence this warning, I will tell Precise to sample the waveform function at the end of the window. Here we now get as read data one, and this is exactly what we initialized here. If we want to pick data at the beginning of the window, we just have to set it to zero here. And here we actually get exactly the same value. So it's again one. The important thing here is we are in the first iteration. So this means we only have one piece of data available and we can only do constant interpolation, even though we told Precise to use first order interpolation. In the second window, this will be more interesting. So let's continue and go to the second iteration here. Okay, now we reached the second iteration of our first window. Again, Precise gives us a warning if we don't use our special API. So let's sample it at the end of the window again. This gives us the minus one that was sent previously by our fluid solver. However, if we use zero now, which corresponds to the beginning of the window, we get a plus one. And this is exactly the initial data that our fluid solver provided. And this means we are now linearly interpolating between the initial data, so the force at the beginning of our time window, and the minus one, which is the force at the end of our time window. So if we want to, for example, now sample at the middle of our time window, we just have to set 0 0.5 times precise dt, and then we get the force at the middle of our time window, which we get from linear interpolation. And this is exactly zero, which is between minus one and plus one. This, for example, might be interesting if you're using something like a midpoint rule for your fluid solver, where you are interested in forces at the middle of your time step and not at the beginning or the end of the time step. And this brings us now to the end of our second example. The rest is exactly the same and what I wanted to show you here is how to use this new API and how the linear interpolation actually happens here. With this you now know how to use linear interpolation in precise and how you can sample from this linear interpolant when you do time stepping. But this is not the only thing you can do with the new API. Imagine you have for the fluid solver the same setup as before, but for the solid solver, you now do actually three individual time steps with the size of one third of the time window within each time window. This is something I will show you very briefly in the next example. In this example, we use on the left hand side our normal fluid solver from before. 
Our solid solver has a few minor changes. I already ran both solvers um, and I will directly jump to the, to the important parts. So first of all, here we see that our window size is again the precise DT, but our solver actually uses only one third of the window size. So this is the kind of subcycling I explained previously. And if we now scroll down to our time windows, we see that there are always these subcycles. And in advance, we actually provide the solver DT, which is only one third. In the first window, we again only have constant interpolation, so we always receive the same data. So you see here, read data is equal to one for every single subcycling step. However, in the second iteration of the first window, we see that this read data changes through each time step. So here we start at 0 0.33, which is close to our initial data, plus one. Then we get minus 0 0.33, and in the last subcycling step, we receive minus one, which is exactly the value that we received from the solid solver at the end of its time step. So you can see that our new API allows us to smoothly interpolate between the beginning and the end of the time step, even if we use subcycling. This brings me to the conclusion of my talk. Are we already there? Is time interpolation available in precise? For parallel implicit coupling, it's basically working in the, in the redirection. If you want, you can check out my pull request and then you can basically do what I just showed you in the previous examples. For serial implicit coupling, there are still some problems, mainly because initialization of data is a bit more difficult here. Currently, precise only allows the first participant to receive initial data and yeah, for waveform relaxation, we actually need both participants to be able to receive data. Let me try to explain this with this picture. The first participant starts here in serial coupling and at the end of its time step, it has data available. So this means the second participant could receive two pieces of data in order to construct a linear interpolant already in the first window. But this is currently not possible in precise just due to the communication schemes that we are using. Let me finish by summarizing some of the steps that we still have in mind for waveform iteration. First, we also have to implement the right direction for our time interpolation. This means we want to buffer data that we get when we are subcycling. And of course, we also have to communicate then several pieces of data within one time step. Additionally, it would be nice to have higher order than just linear interpolation. Currently, if you want to use, for example, waveform order 10, you just get an assertion failure. And if you really want to use higher order time stepping schemes, probably linear inter interpolation is not enough and you would need higher order interpolation schemes. In our paper on quasi Newton waveform iteration, we also discussed how quasi Newton schemes and time interpolation might merge together, and this is also something we still have to implement in precise. And finally, explicit coupling is a totally different story, because here we would require extrapolation and not interpolation of data. With this, I would like to thank you for your attention, and I hope you now know how to use our experimental waveform API. And if you have any questions, feel free to talk to me at the conference or in the discourse forum. See you!